Hey there. I am really excited today to get to share with you the Little Bites workshop. This is the workshop that we're going to do that talks through this the second phase of like starting solid foods with our baby. Last week we talked about starting purees and starting solid foods, and this week we're going to jump into a little bit more on all of the different things that you can do as you expand the foods they're eating, all the different options and things that you can work through and try as you're as you're trying new foods. I know it can be really confusing, and I think you're probably here and watching this because it, it's confusing, it's overwhelming, and there's information overload. You're constantly getting bombarded with different information and seeing pictures or posts or feeling like you're not doing things right because somebody else is feeding their baby this or that and why, oh, my baby's never had that or should my baby have that? It, it can be really confusing and it can be really frustrating to not know exactly what to do. And there's lots of opinions out there, right? There's what you get shared with online. There's the lady at the grocery store behind you in the checkout line that's telling you you shouldn't feed your baby this or you have to feed them this or you got to do it in this order. There's um, your mother-in-law, your your friends, the, the neighbor across the street. There's so many different people telling you, you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. With that, there's a lot of guilt and worry. And it can make it really confusing and you can just feel overwhelmed and it can make stressful meal times. It can make it feel like you're going to get it wrong with just the regular old food that you're feeding your baby or that you're not doing it quite right enough and you need to just do things differently because you're almost there, but what if I'm doing it wrong? Or what if I'm introducing things in the wrong order? And what you're looking for instead is some clarity that, okay, we're on the right path. Some confidence that, yeah, I'm feeding my baby and it may not be what the lady at the grocery store in the checkout line told me that I should do, but I'm doing things in the right order for me and for my family. Um, you want a resource where you can turn to and have this and come back to this and watch the replay if if you forget uh, or you, know, you, you want some more confidence. You just want to be able to like have something to turn to. And that's why I do these workshops is to give you something to turn to as a resource so you don't feel like you have to just wade through everything and read all these differing opinions and all of the comments on Facebook and everywhere. And then just some support and encouragement. Like it's really quite difficult at the end of the day to mess up how you start feeding your child. Because for the entirety of human history, people have been feeding their babies and no one gave a thought to it until the last hundred years. It was feeding what you got. We are nomads. We're cave people. We find food. We feed it to the baby so that everybody survives, propels us forward to the point where we're posting cat gifts on Twitter and all the other things that we now have the ability to do because our ancestors were like, okay, we got to feed this baby. So after today's workshop, you will know what to do when you are ready to move off of purees onto other solid foods. You're going to know when and how to introduce allergenic foods and, and what the importance of that is. And then what to do with gagging, with food refusal, and with choking, because those are the things that I hear at this age and, and the concerns that are raised by parents. So if all that sounds good, type yes in the comments, all caps, so that I know that we're on the right track and you know what we're going to talk about. And, and as you do that, and as I like move and fix my notes here a bit. Um, I would love to know where you're watching from, how old your child is, and what's the biggest thing on your plate right now as a parent. But it, Maybe it's not feeding. Maybe you're just here to learn these things, but you've got something else on your mind as a parent. I would just love to know that because it helps me to know what our parents out there facing right now. So where you're watching from, how old your child is, and then what's the biggest question or thing on your mind as a parent right now. And I will also say as I do this that if you have questions or if you need the replay link, you can text me. You can text 402 and it's down here in the corner, 402-256-0768 and that will get you um, the, the replay link, that will get you the information that you need so that going forward you can, you can refer back to that. Or if you have a specific question, we're gonna have a little question answer time towards the end of this. So if you have a specific question, you can text me and we'll either get to it or I will follow up with you over text or email or whatever um, in the coming days with, with that information because I love getting questions in because it makes it really easy for me not to have to think up what to talk about because I just answer questions and, and that's what I do all day long. I'm a pediatrician, uh, father of five, um, and I love helping parents feel encouraged, supported, affirmed, and confident in, in their, their vocation of parenthood. So um, <clears throat> as we get started, I'm going to talk first and foremost about purees and then allergenic foods and then the gagging and choking thing. So 
Parents usually start with purees. And if you've missed the workshop on starting solid foods and starting purees, and you're wondering what that information is, then either text me and let me know and I'll send you the link or look back um, through your email or however you found this because I did a workshop uh, recently on starting solid foods and purees and, and we're going to kind of jump to the next stage of that. But if you're there and if you want to know this, but you'd also like to know a little bit more about the whole starting foods and when to do that and how to tell if your baby is ready, then check out that workshop as well. And I'll try and post a link in the comments below for that so that you can catch that one as well um, if, if that's the point that you're at, if that's where your questions are. Now, a lot of parents will start with purees between four and seven months, somewhere in there. They're like, okay, we want to try purees. We want to start with, you know, squash or pears or green beans or those sorts of things. And eventually baby is like, okay, guys, I understand that it's fun to feed me messy foods with a spoon, but I would like to try eating myself and I would like to try some more purees and or something more than purees. And, and when can we start on solid food? That's, that's a big question that parents ask. So at the six month visit, when I see them in the office, we always talk about what's next because if I forget, then they often stick on purees for another three months. And if, if I remind, remember and tell them, then by nine months of age, they're basically eating what everyone else is eating at the table. And so I really try and hone in on that and make sure that I explain to them what that looks like. Now the timing varies. Some babies are ready at six months, some are ready at nine months or 10 months to really go to like finger foods and eating finger foods where they pick it up themselves, they put it in their mouth on their own, they chew it, they spit it out or they swallow it, whatever. Um, and, and so it, the timing of that varies. And I usually, the easiest way for me to, to gauge where babies are at is I, I have these sticker pops. It's just, a, it's a tongue depressor with two stickers on the end. So it looks like a little sticker flag thing. And I usually give that to the baby at the six month visit and just kind of watch them to see how they interact with that and how they're able to pick it up if they drop it, how they're able to pass it from hand to hand, all basically all six month olds, put it right into their mouth. And, and those things kind of give me an indicator of where we're at from a fine motor skills and getting food from our fingers to our mouth, because that's kind of a, obviously a hurdle. Like if they're not at the point where they can get food into their hand, they're not, they're not gonna feed themselves those small bites. You can certainly help them, but you don't have to. Um, you can just kind of wait for them to do that. So the main thing that I do then is I show parents, okay, here's where we're at with the pincher grasp, because that's a main thing where if, if, if I'm gonna put food on their tray, they're gonna have to pinch it and pick it up in order to get it into their, their mouth. And I can feel my chair is like bumping my desk here, sorry. Um, <clears throat> So when they can pinch stuff and pick it up, that's a good sign that they're probably about ready to try pinching food, putting food on their tray, pinching it, picking up and putting it in their mouth. That doesn't mean they're gonna eat it, but it does mean that they're probably ready to try. And they're probably at the point where they're already doing a lot of putting, picking things up that they find on the ground and putting them in their mouth. I mean, if, if your baby has done that recently, comment below with what they found on the floor and put in their mouth. Cause I think it catches a lot of parents in this like six to nine month age by surprise that like you can't leave things out on the ground anymore and they're gonna find everything. And, and we have kids that have Legos. So we're always like, what does the baby have in her mouth? Because I'm wondering what that is. Like you clearly they're like, they think it's hilarious and they're trying to get away from you if they if they see that you've made the look like, oh, I think they have something in their mouth. Um, and so then they try and scoot off and scoot away and we're always chasing them down and like trying to figure out what's in their mouth. Um, and, I, and it always makes me wonder, like we don't inspect their, their poop that well, but I imagine that over the years, there's been plenty of little Legos that escaped our, our surveillance and made it into the mouth, swallowed it and made it out the poop. And nobody, ever, nobody was ever the wiser. You know, my son was probably looking for, you know, a Harry Potter Lego head or something like that because it's gone now and we, we don't want it back, but, but um, it's normal. So if you have an interesting thing, just comment below because it's fun to hear what, what I mean, it, it certainly is a safety issue that you want to keep things safe. But at the end of the day, all kids find stuff to put in their mouth um, and you just do the best you can to protect them and keep them safe and realize that they're going to put a lot of things in their mouth, um, things inside the house and things outside the house, um, like rocks and stuff like that. Okay, tangent. So if they have a pincher grasp, if they're starting to do that, then I think it's fine to start introducing foods and that's kind of the when and then uh, what is what foods do we start with? And, and you go to the grocery store and unfortunately, you know, the, the baby food aisle where you were has a bunch of stuff next to it. Like, um, actually I have a bag full of them down here. <clears throat> so I've done other videos. You got puffs, you got squeezy pouches, you got all these things and it's like, oh, well, 
If they can crawl and they can do a pincher grasp, then this is the food for them. Well, this is a food for them, but honestly, this stuff costs more by ounce than filet mignon. So I would save puffs for special outings or Cheerios or things like that. Like you can certainly start with those and people get in their head that that's what you're supposed to start with because these companies are really good at making you feel like, oh, this is exactly based on my baby's developmental age, what they should be eating. And, and then it makes it easy. But you do not have to do puffs. You do not have to do yogurt bites or those sorts of things. Um, you can just do small bites of soft food. And when I talk about soft food, I'm talking about fruits and vegetables. I'm talking about um, meats, cheeses, uh, dairy products, peanut butter, eggs. We're going to talk about allergenic foods in just a moment. But basically small bites of food that you think they would enjoy. If they really liked, you know, pureed carrot, then um, either cook some carrot so it's soft or get some canned carrot, cut it up into little bites, put it on their tray and see what they do. What they'll probably do is they'll pinch it, they'll pick it up, they'll put it in their mouth and they'll be like, oh, this is kind of a different texture, but I remember this flavor, so I'm going to eat it. Or this is a same sort of thing, but I'm going to spit it out because it's going to be really fun to watch my mom and dad um, get excited when I spit out the food and that sort of thing. So, um, there's no specific ordering that you need to go in. Certainly, there are there are people online that, that teach things like baby led weaning and all those things, and those are perfectly fine. I find that a lot of parents get a little overwhelmed with the rigidity of you have to do this on this day and this day and this day. And and if that's you, then it might be best to just like look at the food that we're eating. If you can get local food, if you can get in-season food, those are going to be obviously best, but not always an option for families based on where they live and their budget and all those things. Canned fruits and vegetables are totally fine to cut up into little bites and give to them. Fresh, even better. But but at the end of the day, I, it's not like I write down, you know, mm, this baby had uh, heirloom tomatoes and uh, organic um, homegrown carrots versus this baby in the next room had canned carrots and um, some canned beets and things like that uh, and, and expect a difference in outcome. So I, 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 I don't get that granular in the way that I talk with parents and I don't expect you to um, only provide your baby with naturally sourced foods at all times because uh, I mean there is a convenience factor to to living in you know wherever you live that, that you can get groceries and those sorts of things and, and eat those foods as well. Um, People often ask about like meats. When can we introduce meats? Well, you can introduce them at the same time. I would just do like little bites of meat cut up that's, you know, soft, ground beef, cooked chicken, um, pork, shellfish, foods, whatever it is. Any of those meats are totally fine. Just cut them into small pieces. It's easier for babies when they're softer. And, and if you really want to feed your baby some steak, just cut it up into really tiny bites, even if they don't have teeth. That's another question that I often get is what about teeth? Do they need teeth? They can have steak before they have teeth. They just gum it up into really tiny bites. They, You give them to them in tiny bites, they gum it up and they swallow it and, and they enjoy that. I mean, it's an expensive first food um, to do, you know, some prime rib or something like that. But if you want, you can give those things to your baby. And, and by nine months, like I said, most babies are kind of at the point where they're almost ready to just start eating what everyone else is eating at the table, cut up into tiny bites. Now, I think it's best to just follow your child's lead. You do not have to say, on this day, we have to do this. On this day, we have to do that. We have to try all these different foods and different textures and things like that. Provide a variety. Follow your child's lead. They know best. You know best for them. You can see that they like these things, that they keep gagging on them, or they're not quite ready. Let's give it another week or two and then try again. And you'll be amazed at how quickly they go from gagging on the food that you get to just gobbling it up. And it's really fun to watch that progression and think, wow, two weeks ago, they just gagged on this and spit it all out. And it was a huge mess. And now they're just like, can't get enough of the, whatever food it is. So hopefully that makes sense. I think keeping it simple is easiest. Like I said, fruits, vegetables, meats, cheeses, peanut butter, eggs, cut it up into small bites or give it to them in little strips that they can hold on and not on. Both are fine options. If you're able to do fresh in season foods, great. If not canned cooked foods, create kindergartners as well. There's, I, don't, I really, I mean, it's good health wise to do those things, but I don't think at the end of the day, they're not going to sort them into different kindergarten class or put one kid in diff math and the other in regular people math um, based on, you know, how you sourced your baby carrots for them when they were seven months old. That's what I'll say about that. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is allergenic foods. This is a big question, and um, we're going to talk about this at the same time because it's, it's the same time sort of thing that I want you to start looking at introducing those allergenic foods. Now, the old recommendations, you can go back and find all sorts of old recommendations on, on the timing of it, and, and we have old flyers that are still, you know, in some drawers around here that say like no peanuts before one or no peanuts before two, no eggs, no dairy, blah, blah, blah. What that did 
was it created you know it paid for all these EpiPens. It, it the EpiPen companies were very happy with that rec- those recommendations because it created a bunch of kids with food allergies and what we know is that those that was a mistake to recommend avoidance of allergenic foods in the first year of life what we have learned through a lot of studies the leap study a bunch of other studies that have been done is that early introduction of allergenic foods helps prevent allergies early introduction of allergenic foods helps prevent food allergies. There's this window of time where your body is more accepting of these different foods. And if we avoid giving it during that window, then there, it increases the chance that your, your baby could then become uh, allergic to given food. The two that are most important are peanut butter and eggs. So I always recommend at the six month visit that they start introducing those on a regular basis. You can get really granular on like how many and how frequently just on a regular basis. Uh, We love peanut butter at our house. So as often as we give the rest of our kids peanut butter, we give our six month old peanut butter, Um, which is maybe a little too often, but that's for a different day. Um, What you want to do is do it on a regular basis so that their body becomes acclimated to that and it sees it on a regular basis and it doesn't become sensitive to that. If instead you withhold it and you say, we're not doing any peanuts in our house till two because of the risk of food allergies. Well, what happens then is the window closes and then your, your baby is more likely to react to that and say, hey, this is not what we were expecting. Allergy response, immune response, anaphylaxis, those sorts of things. So on a regular basis, starting at six months of age, you should introduce allergenic foods. There's a couple caveats. And of course, you should talk with your own pediatrician to make these decisions for your family. If the child has severe eczema or a history of food allergy, those are things that we need to talk through first. But the average bear baby on the street should be getting peanut exposure, egg exposure on a regular basis. What I typically recommend for peanut butter is if they're still on purees to just throw some peanut butter like jar you know the peanut butter off your shelf into whatever puree they're getting i mean it probably doesn't go well with peas maybe it makes peas taste better i don't know but uh sweet potatoes pears whatever throw a little bit of peanut butter in there stir it up it'll thicken it up which just gives them a new flavor a new texture to experience and do that on a regular basis a couple times per week a few you know spoonfuls at least is is the perfect amount for them for eggs same sort of thing usually i just tell parents scramble eggs um, chop them up into really tiny bites and put them in the purees as well those probably pair better you know say savory side of things with some of the different vegetables that you might give to baby, but it's so small that you don't notice. And, and we're just trying to get some bites in them so that their their immune system recognizes them as this is a normal food. We're going to have this on a regular basis and then keep going from there. Same with dairy. The, the eggs and the, and the peanut butter are the most important, but dairy is good to introduce as well on a regular basis. Um, so the easiest ways to do that would be yogurt or cheeses. You don't have to do yogurt bites if you don't want to. It's like really expensive freeze dried little bites of yogurt that you can get at the store for much cheaper. Instead, I would just get regular old yogurt, put it on a spoon and give it to them. Um, I've done several podcast episodes on um, food allergies. And so if you're looking for more information, check out my podcast. It's called Raising Good Parents. And, and we'll drop a link to below for that. But there's a lot of food allergy episodes on there. I've talked with a lot of different food allergy experts and have some good information for you on food allergies and, and the prevention. So you feel like it's you know more than just me saying this, although this is what I say to my patients every day. We have a really low incidence in my practice of food allergies. It's not 100% because of course some kids get food allergies no matter what we do, but we wanna protect by and large and see a drop in food allergies. The way to do that is early, often introduction of food allergies. Hopefully that makes sense. Comment yes below because I know I'm talking fast and I'm saying a lot, but I would love it if you just comment yes below if that makes sense, if that gives you a little peace, mind, and clarity about what we're doing here in terms of starting solid, solid foods, like moving past purees, and then also if that makes sense in terms of introducing allergenic foods and if that helps you to know what to do going forward with those. Now, the third thing that I want to talk about, because everybody asks about this, and this is the biggest worry that everybody has, and I want to give you some peace of mind and reassurance about choking and gagging. Now, <clears throat> there is a difference between choking and gagging. A lot of parents tell me that their baby chokes on foods all the time, and really what they're meaning is gagging. Gagging is normal. Gagging is expected, and it's like... <laughs> kind of not handling the food quite well enough and and baby will work through it on his or her own. You don't have to pat them on the back. You don't have to say, are you okay? You just let them work through it on their own. I actually found really good um, pictures of this to share it with you. So, and, and this is just from my internet searching. Um, choking is loud and red 
or no, gagging is loud and red, let them go ahead, and then choking, quiet and blue, they need help from you. So really when I think about that, if it's loud and red, let them go ahead. Meaning if they're kind of like working through something and doing a little bit of coughing and spitting out of their food, you don't have to run over it. You don't have to get the big eyes because then they get scared and then that just perpetuates everything, you know, and worsens the cycle right then. Instead, just, oh, it looks like you're having a little bit of trouble with that. Oh, it looks like you're spitting that out. Yeah, good job. You can just, you know, try and remain calm, although everybody gets really worried as expected when that's happening, but try and keep your cool if they're loud and red. Um, if they are, on the other hand, quiet and blue, meaning their airway is blocked, then that is choking. And usually their eyes are much bigger than that. And they're choking. And then they need help from you. And it's good if you're able to, to do infant CPR classes, infant Heimlich maneuver, or not Heimlich maneuver, but infant choking classes. I mean, there's certainly good videos and everything like that for those that aren't able to actually do like on hand, in, in person, hands-on um, CPR or choking. But, but, but if that they're quiet and blue, they need help from you. So I really like that. I'm going to, I haven't seen that before, that specific rhyme, but that's really helpful for me to remember is if they're loud and red, just let them keep going. You don't have to do anything. If on the other hand, they're quiet and blue, then that means they need help from you. And that means going over to them, getting them out of their high chair, getting that food dislodged from their throat. The most common thing that we do is back blows. So you basically put the baby face down and do some back blows, and that helps get their um, what's bothering them out of their throat. There's also this good little um, gagging versus choking. So gagging is red, tongue will thrust out, face may go red. Um, you may be here sputtering, coughing, or gagging. The gag reflex is there on purpose to keep the airway safe and open. And so that's what the airway is for. That's what the gagging is for, is to keep that airway open. You do not have to intervene. You don't have to get the big eyes. Are you okay? Are you okay? Oh my gosh. Um, because that will just make it worse and it makes them scared. And then they'll take breaths because they're so scared and they see their parents so scared. Let them work it out. And on the flip side, with choking, their face will go blue. They're not getting air have an ineffective cough and that means they need help. So then you're going to start the baby choking sequence. I'll, I'll put some links in, in the notes here for this too so that you can check out those resources and find a place to do infant CPR, infant choking sequence um, to help them dislodge that object. So gagging is normal and common and you'll see that all the time. Choking is rare and serious and you will rarely if ever see that. I rarely see babies that actually had a real choking spell but I hear all the time parents saying that their baby was choking on something when in reality they were just gagging and spitting on that. So hopefully that makes sense and it gives you some peace of mind. You will see gagging. That is normal. That is just airway protection and learning to manage those textures. If they do that on a repeated basis for, for a specific item that you give them a specific texture or consistency, then maybe wait a week or two and then try again. But keep trying because that will help them to develop those textures. If on the other hand, you um, lose your cool about it, which is, is normal and expected, then try and reintroduce it sooner because but you want them to see that you feel comfortable and confident with their eating and it doesn't over worry you because if they see your big eyes and if they feel the tension of you, you know, letting them have a little slice of banana that they gagged on last week, that's going to just, they're going to see that and feel that and that's going to impart some of that onto them. And what you want to do is try and just remain cool and calm and that will help them to feel cool and calm as you're trying these new foods, knowing that they will gag from time to time. They will very rarely, if ever, actually choke where you have to do anything like back blows or anything like that for your baby. So hopefully that makes sense and gives you some peace of mind. Now, as we move forward, I would love to know from you what it is from what we've talked about so far that has been most helpful. If you could comment below, if it's talking about what to do after purees, if it's talking about the allergenic foods, or if it's talking about the difference between gagging and choking, it helps me to know kind of where to focus in the future for these sorts of talks. If, if you share with me like what, what has helped you the most thus far. And while you do that, I'm going to get a drink of water. And then we're going to answer some questions. So if you have questions, you can text me, you can comment below. We'll try and get to as many of them as we can today. And then we will get back to you with any answers that we didn't quite get to. Um, I also have something that I want to tell you about at the end of this too. It's called Unpicky Eaters. And it's a new course for parents that I put together that goes through exactly how to approach feeding your child from starting solid foods to expanding options to really enjoying dinner time more as a family and kind of the mindset and the practical strategies on how to 
enjoy mealtime more so that it's less stressful, there isn't drama, there aren't things that interfere, you're not having all these rules or figuring out what to do. So it's called Unpicky Eaters, and I'll tell you more about it at the end um, after we do these questions. But I wanted to just kind of give you a heads up in case you have to drop off that Unpicky Eaters is something that I'm really excited about because it's going to help a lot of parents to feel more confident and comfortable with the process of starting foods and with the process of mealtime as you get this toddler that has opinions and shares them with you. And the way they share their opinions with you is throwing their food, refusing to eat their food, um, yelling, screaming, feeding it to the dog, all those different things. So Unpicky Eaters helps parents to have confidence by, by showing you how to work through those things and the mindset to have as you start on this food journey so that you can enjoy it more and your child and family can and you can enjoy dinner time more. So that's all I'll say right now about Unpicky Eaters, but I'm really excited to share that with you. Um, what we're going to do is we got a couple questions. Okay. So first question, continue formula after 12 months to ensure nutrition if baby is reluctant with table food? No. Unless you have a specific medical reason told to you by your pediatrician or doctor that you need to continue formula, you do not need to continue formula after 12 months of age. If anything, that can make it just be like, well, why would I eat table food? My parents are going to feed me a bottle and um, I'll get all the nutrition that I need from that. So at 12 months of age, what I tell parents in my practice is you stop bottles, you stop formula. You can keep breastfeeding as long as you'd like, um, but but in general, baby's main liquid other than breast milk, if you're breastfeeding, is going to be water. And then you can do whole milk, you can do water, you can do oat milk or almond milk or whatever you would like at meal times. The rest of the day, it should be water for hydration. The, the nutrition that we get is from the food that we eat, not from what we drink. So knowing that you do not have to continue formula, you don't have to offer toddler milk. Toddler milk is the biggest racket that just convinces parents that they're doing things wrong if they're not continuing to give their baby food uh, or nutrition through you know a bottle or, or a sippy cup or something like that. It's like you know the average 35 year old male female doesn't need to insure, drink insure you know drinks for for elderly people to get the nutrition because they can just eat regular food and and consume plenty of that and so your baby doesn't need those things and if anything it's going to make them less likely to eat table food because i know that i'm going to get this really tasty creamy full of fat full of protein full of carb milkshake here if i just refuse to eat the lasagna that my mom and dad made me for dinner and so i would highly recommend avoiding toddler formula and you can tell that i'm a little impassioned about it um, because i find that formula companies are like, well, hey, we got these parents to feed their baby for a whole year. What if we could get them to do it for two or three? Wouldn't that be a lot more money? Um, and so they create toddler formula. And, and, it, and it interferes with feeling comfortable and confident for parents in starting foods and doing table foods. And it just prolongs this phase of when can my baby just eat the food that we're eating versus when can my, how long does my baby really need to stay on this formula? It's really expensive. It's not what the rest of the family is doing. No, you want your baby at 12 months of age sitting at the table with you, feeling comfortable with trying foods. Even if they're picky, that's normal. Pickiness is normal. It's normal to have picky kids. And it's normal for them to like their green beans sometimes and not like them others. But you don't have to fill in the gaps with formula to make sure they're getting enough. Your toddler will show you what they need. So I would just not continue on with formula after 12 months of age. Their food should be food. Their liquid should be water. And then at mealtimes, if you'd like to give them some milk, um, just a cup full of cow's milk or almond milk or oat milk or whatever milk you like, um, then, then that's how I approach that. And that's what I tell all the parents in my practice. Okay. Okay, next question. Do you recommend ready set food or spoonful one powders for allergen introduction or just real food? You can probably guess what I'm going to say here. There are people out there, there are companies out there that really want to make money off of your uncertainty and discomfort with making sure you're doing things right. So instead of peanut butter, your Skippy, your Jif, your Peter Pan from the cabinet, why don't you just buy this super expensive $50 per month powder and mix it into their milk so that you don't make a mistake? Okay. We know that parents are much smarter than that, and you do not have to spend that money. You want to stick to real food. You do not need to do spoonful one. You do not need to do ready, set food. You give your baby real food to help them to not have allergies. You don't need to spend all this money. I know that they have really clever marketing techniques. I know that you see them on Instagram because anytime I accidentally click on one of their things, I see it for the next like 20 days. All this stuff about ready, set food, spoonful one, yummy, all these different brands where they're just trying to convince you that you're doing it wrong and they are the only ones that are going to make sure that you do it 
it right. And that is not the case whatsoever. Feed your baby real food, save your money. If you want, send your money to me and I'll donate it or something like that. If you're like, okay, I was going to spend all this. No, I'm kidding. Don't send the money to me. Um, save the money for date night. Don't spend the money on these powders that tell you that they're going to protect your baby from allergens. You already know this. People have been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years without these powders and other things. We can certainly do that when we have full access to all these foods at our grocery store. We don't even have to go to the grocery store. We can just do Instacart or Amazon to get the food that we need. You do not need to spend your money on these powders that make it seem like you're doing everything wrong. Avoid companies that make you feel like you're doing it wrong. Focus on supporting yourself, getting empowered to, to handle this on your own. Okay. Next question. Throwing food and food refusal. Do we make him stay in his chair? The one bite rule, the no thank you bite, so confused and stressed at dinner time. This is totally normal and expected. And it's usually between 12 and 15 months of age where the parents start to get really stressed about mealtime because all of a sudden they are seeing this baby that used to just eat whatever they gave them or kind of spit it out and it was really cute. Now they're throwing their food on the floor. They're throwing their food across the room. They're feeding it to the dog. They're screaming no. <sighs> It can be really frustrating to know how to handle this because you want to do it right. You want to enjoy mealtime more, but you're just worried or you're feeling like, okay, I'm really not sure what to do. What's the best approach? Do we make them take a bite? Do we make them sit at the table? Do we make them um, eat their food uh, or go to bed hungry? It can be really confusing. Bottom line is do what supports a peaceful mealtime without creating habits that allow your child to get away with not eating the food that everyone else is eating. If they throw their food on the floor and you say, oh, it doesn't look like you look like lasagna. I know that you like peanut butter and jelly. I'm going to make you a peanut butter and jelly quick. Hold on. But guess what they're going to do every time they get a lasagna? They're going to throw it on the floor because you've shown them that the, 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 what the consequence is they get peanut butter and jelly or chicken nuggets or hot dogs or macaroni and cheese or something like that. If instead you say, oh my gosh, it looks like you must not be hungry right now. I made you green beans and chicken parmesan, but you threw it on the floor. So here's what we're going to do. You can sit at the table. You can color a picture if you want while we eat. And then if you're hungry later, you can have your food. And then when they, and then you take their food and you cover it up, you put it in the fridge. You know, if you can keep it in the same plate, then that's great because then they'll quickly associate, oh, this is the same blue plate. This is the same dinosaur plate that I had earlier and you're giving me this food back again. I guess next time it probably doesn't make sense for me to throw it on the floor because I'm just going to eat it again later. And so that would be what I would do. And that's what I counsel patients to do every day when they're at that 12, 15, 18 month age where their child is doing this. I tell them exactly that. And I have very few patients that are extremely picky eaters. And vast majority of children are picky to some extent. Uh, most adults are picky to some extent. You won't see me ordering specific items that the, when I get to pick what I want to eat, you know, when you go to a restaurant or something like that, I don't always get whatever. I can't think of the foods that I don't really like because I do like quite a bit of foods now, but adults are like that too. And so why would we expect a child to just immediately eat and love every single food that we offer them if we as adults don't like every single food that we're offering? Cucumbers. I don't like cucumbers. I will not ever be the one to be like, yeah, I'll have that. Can you add extra cucumbers or something like that? I don't like cucumbers. So I would expect that your child has things that they don't like, and that is okay. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. What you do is continue to offer, and if they throw their foot on the floor, you're, they're telling you that they're not hungry right now, which is fine. And what you're going to do is you're going to take their plate, you're going to cover it up, you're going to put it in the fridge. And then when they come to you and say, I'm hungry, in whatever way they do as a 12-month-old, a 15-month-old, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, you get the food back out to them and you, you know, graciously say, here, here's your dinner. Great. Go ahead and sit down and eat it. Would you like me to warm it up? That's all you need to do. So hopefully that helps. I want to encourage parents to enjoy mealtime because you work a long day. You want to come home and connect with your child and connect with your family and have a peaceful mealtime, but there's so much stress wrapped up in it. And and I want you to feel empowered to do that. And, and so questions like this are perfect. This is what I hear every day, all day long. And so like I was saying earlier, what I've created is a course called Unpicky Eaters. It's a course for families that really want to enjoy mealtime. It's something that you look forward to every day. It doesn't cause or add stress to your day. 
It might be a little bit messy from time to time. You might be picking stuff up and using more paper towels than you were used to before you had kids, but you still enjoy it in the grand scheme of things and say that this was a meal time that connected us, even though he threw his food on the floor. And so Unpicky Eaters walks through exactly how to do that from starting solid foods to expanding options to really enjoying a no drama dinner experience with your growing child. Unpicky Eaters walks you through exactly all of those different ages and stages with your child so that you have a plan and you know what to do when they're throwing their food. You know what to do when they're refusing their green beans. You know how to introduce allergenic foods and what to do with peanut butter and eggs and those sort of things. You know what to do if your child has what you think is an allergic reaction and how to handle that. You know what to do when your child is on a food strike or why do they always eat so well on the daycare report that I get but then they refuse to eat all their foods at home. We talk through all of those things inside Unpicky Eaters. I will drop a link below so that you can join Unpicky Eaters if you want. I'm really excited to share this with families. The response so far has been fantastic because it just gives you peace of mind that you're doing what you need to. And and I know that it costs some money and I was just telling you that you shouldn't um, buy things like Spoonful One or Ready Set Food or those things that, that you know prey upon your weaknesses as a parent. What Unpicky Eaters does is it empowers you as a parent and it's the just education. Here's what I would recommend. Here's what I try. Here's what I tell my patients. Here's what the research supports so that you are empowered to go forward and, and do your family best by implementing these practices and figuring out what works for you to enjoy mealtime more. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. Even if you don't join Unpicky Eaters, I hope this has been helpful and it's given you lots of information. If you want more information, text me, reach out, join Unpicky Eaters if you want the full experience and get all the information that we have to offer. And if you're looking for more strategies, especially for mealtime with your 12 to 18 to 24 month old, I have another workshop called No Drama Dinners where we walk through how to start mealtimes as everybody's sitting down to the table without getting into these battles, without getting into all these rules and other things like that. So if that's something that interests you, check out the links below. I'll have a link to that as well. Unpicky Eaters, No Drama Dinners. Keep up the good work and thanks for your time and attention. Have a good day.